So whether it's physical science, life science, marine biology, biology, earth space science, chemistry, physics, whatever it is you're studying, you're probably going to start to hear talk a little bit about what is science. The basic of science seems to be like the first topic that hits every single science class. It's like they try to get that in your head. And yet it escapes so many people what science actually is or how it works. Now everybody knows that science is like something that you go to school to learn. But what people don't realize is that it should really be something that you go to school to do. And that's kind of like the mentality that I have in my class and that's why I use the flipped classroom because it's cooler to spend less time talking about science and more time actually doing it. So for the most part we're going to learn about science this year by actually doing science. We're going to be doing experiments, we're going to be writing about them, we're going to be seeing the patterns, we're going to be look, making observations, we're going to be doing science the way it's supposed to be done, raising hypotheses and testing them. But either way, what is science? Because you basically definitely have to know a little bit about it before you start doing it. Now, the interesting thing about science instead of the other uh, subjects that you should go to school to learn is that it's not just a body of knowledge. Like it's not just like history where you learn about stuff that happened in the past. It's also method. It's also a process. So science is both a body of knowledge that's been accumulated over thousands of years of research about the natural world. And it's also the process or the method by which we actually learn about the natural world. It's like how we organize the evidence, the data and learn about the world that we live in. And so that's what science is. So as a field of study, science is focused on explorations of the natural world. So what does that mean? It means to observe anything that happens naturally. A phenomena uh, in biology, chemistry, physics, uh, life sciences, earth-based science, whatever you call it, it's something that's observable, something that's measurable. Now, you may argue that you can't observe an atom, that you can't observe the Big Bang, you can't observe a lot of things in science, and that it, in a way it kind of seems metaphysical, but not really. All of these things can be quantifiable, can be assessed, can be quali qualitatively or quantitatively. We're going to talk about what those things mean later in this lecture series. And they can be assessed. There's a procedure to collect information about these things. It's empirical. That's another important word that's going to be thrown out at you. Empirical it means uh, something that is actually de uh, devised, data that's devised in order to prove something. And so science is, is a body of knowledge that tries to explore this natural world by collecting and organizing information about it, which we call data. Now, this is a very methodical process. It's methodic because we have to find exactly how what we want and make sure that other people can do the same and they can replicate what we did to verify that what we did it was actually right or at least not wrong, you know? We'll talk about that means in a second too. But either way, what I'm trying to say here is that science is an organized and methodic way to explore the world, to collect empirical evidence about it. And then when we have all this evidence, all this information stored in data banks, especially nowadays in computers, what we now do is try to see patterns in this data, try to uh, look for connections. And we do this to something that we call critical thinking or logistic thinking, uh, logic to see what caused something. Basically, cause and effect is trying to establish that link is the ultimate goal of science because we want to see these patterns. For example, you see the peacock here on the, on the bottom left and you see it seems random the way that his coloration pattern, his plumage works. But if you actually look at carefully, you will see that there's a pattern and that there's actually a process by which this pattern is established. That it's a biologically, genetically based process that interacts with the environment to form a unique plumage that's unique to, to this peacock, but is yet follow some set of rules. And if you know enough about those rules, you can even make a prediction before the peacock even grows its plumage about the way it's going to look like if you know enough about the environment and the genes or where the peacock is going to be. So once you know the rules and you know the evidence, you can you know the patterns that exist between the evidence, you can then form the next step, which is to propose explanations that can explain the patterns that you see and then those explanations can be evaluated by the same kind of process, by the evidence, so that you can now take the final leap in science, which is to make predictions and to control the natural, the natural world. And so science is about empiricism, about proving things, about collecting information. Science is methodic because it, it looks for an organized method of collecting information. It is also about logic reasoning to make, make connections between this information. It's also a lot about imagination so that you can see and formulate uh, explanations for, for these patterns. Now you see even computers can, can do basically everything that 
that humans can do in this method. We can, uh, computers can observe the natural world. There's cameras, there's microphones, there's all sorts of sensors to, to simulate the human senses. Computers can be methodic and organized, right? Computers can do logical reasoning. And in fact, the whole computer language programming is based on logical reasoning. And if you actually read the programming language, it's all about logic. Now, of course, you would say that computers can't make that pro came up, come up with that program, but you'd be surprised about some of the things that uh, computers can do. They can actually, um, some programs can almost be self-intelligent and come up with solutions when there's problems, you know. Uh, but of course, there was someone who designed that in the first place, but it doesn't mean a design couldn't have accidentally come ha have happened. We'll talk more about this when we do evolution later in the year. Uh, looking at computer programming is a great way to simulate that uh, intelligent design versus a random chaotic um, organization th process thing. But either way, continue with the line of thought that I was talking about. C computers can do all of that, but perhaps what computers cannot do is have the imagination to propose uh, the most likely explanation that's perhaps a novel, a new explanation for something that has never been observed before. So computers can be empirical, computers can be methodic, they can even use logic, but they can't have the imagination that takes the last step to propose those explanations which can then be tested and used to make predictions and maybe even control. And that's the ultimate thing that differentiates this from machine. Google, in fact, that's what Google does. Google collects information from the web, it's empirical, and then in a methodic process, it follows a specific protocol to do so, and then using logical reasoning, it sorts the websites to match your search as best as possible. But what Google can't do is create, the search engine can't create a new way of search. That's a human that did that. And it's also a human that devises a website, that creates a website. So it, in a way, um, that is a perfect example of what I'm talking about. But remember, that's basically what science is as a field of study. So the goal of science then is to investigate or to observe this natural world in order to understand or explain it to the point that we can make useful predictions about the future and perhaps control because of that. If you watch it enough and you understand to a point that you see the patterns and you then propose an explanation, you test it and you find out it's true, then now you can say you understand it. And if you understand how it works, then you can make a prediction, just like the plumage that we talked about with the peacock. And once you make that prediction, you can maybe even now that you understand how to work it, make a change on it if, if, so, if you so choose. And that's what's so cool about science. It, and all the technology that you see around you today is a product of this method. And we'll talk about that as well in this lecture series. Science ultimately creates this technology because uh, all of the things we learn through science we use to control things. And so more technology and that makes our life easier. Now, one of the coolest things about science, is, which is a lot different from a lot of other fields of study and a lot of other ways of thinking, it's that it's always changing. It's the dynamic uh, field of study. In fact, when I went to school for biology, a lot of the things which are going to be learning this year together are things that I didn't even learn about when I was in high school because those things didn't even exist yet. Uh, the frontier of biotechnology is a completely new part of science and we're still trying to understand many of these things and I'm sure that 20 years from now when you're in a position to uh, become a teacher, though I probably wouldn't advise it to most of you, uh, it's not an easy job, but if you find yourself in a position, you'll probably find yourself teaching things which are not the same things that you've learned when you went to high school. Science is dynamic. It's always changing, and it's changing because it's always asking questions. It's always doing a process that we call inquiry. Inquiry means to ask questions. So what science always does is to challenge everything. And so even the things that science has proven in the past are open to debate. Scientists are constantly doing what we call peer review, which is collaboratively evaluating the work that they have. It's like the science is always checking its work. It's like kind of Wikipedia. Like you create something, you create a document, but then there's a whole wire web of people which are examining that document, and if they find something wrong with it, they can fix it and provide their own support, their own references, their own evidence to, to make those changes. And that's what it comes with, this, the social aspect of science. You know, just like social networking creates better encyclopedias, um, it's the same idea with uh, science. The more discourse, the more argumentation, the more scientists talk to each other and question each other and try to bash each other's ideas, the more robust, the more strong the scientific knowledge becomes. Because it withstands a lot of criticism, and, it, and it, when it, if it doesn't withstand, it's forced to change. And so ideas which were true years ago are now 
challenged or changed or missed or reinterpreted based on new evidence that has come up to light because somebody dared to ask questions about something that was considered set in stone. So we have learned from that. I mean, now say that in science, nothing is really set in stone. Everything is what it is as far as we currently understand it. But there might be opportunities for change this understanding if in the future new evidence comes to enlighten us more than we have already. Another important part of science is the idea of creativity. One thing that I, one of my favorite quotes, it's up to my website, is, is that si imagination is more important than knowledge. And that's by Albert Einstein, which you see there in the, in the screen. The importance of creativity cannot be understated in science. The, the whole thing is that you need creativity for everywhere. When you see that data, when you see those patterns that, you, that logic made you see, and you see those connections, it takes a creative mind to find connections. It takes a creative mind to, to explain those connections, to design experiments, to explain the results from experiments. And so science is, is all about creativity. It's about using the power of your mind to create new things. And that's why, as part of the being in a science class, you're challenged to be at the highest level of critical thinking. It's not just about reading texts. It's not about just learning facts. It's not even about just using those facts. It's about creating new facts, discovering things which may not have been written before, discovering things that you may not have read in a textbook, that you discover by yourself because you sat down and you tried something. That is the beauty of science. It's not just a body of knowledge. It's also a body of discovery. It's a way to challenge everything there is and look for something new. And there's a lot of different people doing that. It's a multidisciplinary field of study. Because unlike other things where you just have like basically one kind of uh, a thing, in science there's like biology, chemistry, physics, and in many ways they have nothing to do with each other except for the process, which is the same for everybody. But whether you're doing psychology or biology or earth-based science or chemistry or physics, the process is going to be the same. And, in, and at times, a lot of different disciplines will try to explain the same phenomenon. For example, look at evolution, which is one of the most important theories in biology, which we're going to be learning this year, or in science in general. Different fields of studies have observed and contributed to the theory of evolution. You have, for example, a geology, a fossil record, which definitely has contributed a lot. You have uh, physics, and our understanding of the way that you know quantum physics and particle physics works also helps us understand the early beginnings of the history of life and also the statistics of what makes life continue to change over time you know the ideas like entropy conservation of mass and energy and all of those things you also have anatomy study of comparative anatomy has been crucial to prove the, the theory of evolution uh, chemistry biochemistry is fundamental understanding of the particles of life was fundamental to understand the source of the change which drives evolution, which is mutations. Biogeography, which is studying patterns in distribution of animals around the world, crucial to understand how those patterns are indi indicative of the relationship that exists between the environments and the animals that evolved in it. There's also genetics, or understanding of how, how these changes or mutations are passed on from generation to generation, and then you know, become uh, susceptible to natural selection, which then changes these things. We're going to explain all of this when we do evolution later in the year. I'm just showing you how different aspects of science are all going to contribute to one thing. Math is also part of evolution. We learn in population genetics how to calculate probabilities, parsimony, and all of that to try to be, understand as simplest as possible this one phenomenon. So it's about looking at the, at the explanation that has the highest probability, and it has everything to do with math. You have zoology and field studies and botany, scientists that study uh, animals in, in plants and other things in the real, out there nature, also have provided evidence to support the theory of evolution. You have biomedical engineering, you have biotechnology, you have geneticists, uh, you have microbiologists, you have um, molecular biologists, you have... All of these things have contributed to the formation of the theory of evolution. So as anything is with science, you will often find that when you study something in science, contributions from multiple fields of study actually be, make our, our understanding of that. And so that is why science is so robust, because you can look at it from different angles. You can look at it together with other people. You can challenge each other, and together you build much more than you would build ever by yourself. Just like... Look at Facebook, for example. It's a website that it's not 
it doesn't produce anything. The makers of Facebook barely create any content except for those stupid games that consume your life. Who creates the content that you see in Facebook? The people who are in it. And, but it's a massive amount of content because there's a massive amount of people working together to create it. And then organically it grows and that in itself simulates the way that life works. So I love sites because it's, it's, it's a field of study that teaches about the natural world. It's a way to understand the natural world and it works the same way that the natural world does. All right, we'll continue talking about science in the next video. See you guys then.